Oh boy, today we're going to deal with it. One of the real hot button topic issues of modern times and what the Bible says and one that has been used to pummel many believers has created a lot of issues in the public square and that is the issue of homosexuality and we'll also talk a little bit today about uh, being trans. Uh, so, in the Bible, there are several passages that do condemn homosexuality. And so, they are Genesis chapter 9, excuse me, Genesis chapter 19, which is the account of Sodom and Gomorrah, so Genesis 19. Leviticus 18.22, and I'm actually going to read it because it's the shortest and most direct. You will... <clears throat> you will not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13 says the same thing. So Deuteronomy 19, Leviticus 18, 22, Leviticus 20, 13. Three Old Testament passages. And then in the New Testament, we have 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. We have 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. And then Romans chapter 1 verses 26 and 27. But really, the bulk of Romans 1 addresses sin, uh, how, how widespread it is, and that how unnatural it is, and this is one of the examples that is given, is that of homosexuality. There are uh, other optional interpretations that are given by uh, people who believe that homosexuality is okay. They argue there are only a handful of verses that address it. I would agree. Uh, the Bible does not address this issue very much. I believe there's a reason, and I'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> um, but the Bible does speak to it. Now, when it comes to transvestitism, or however you say it, being a transvestite, we don't have nearly the number of statements. As a matter of fact, we only have one verse in the entire Bible that actually speaks to a person being trans in any form or fashion, and that's in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5. And here's what that verse says. A woman will not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Um, everybody in those days wore dresses, were like robes, but it was a pretty clear distinction between uh, male and female. So since there are so few verses that address these subjects, and there are possibly ways, other ways of interpreting them, um, Particularly, believe it or not, the verses in Leviticus, it could relate to Canaanite worship prostitution, and that's a whole other Theology Thursday for another time that I want to address today. So there are other ways of doing it. They really miss the point. They miss the issue. The Bible actually, believe it or not, does not condemn that many things. It repeatedly condemns idolatry. It comp uh, repeatedly condemns not taking care of the outcast. The Bible over and over and over again says we need to take care of the widows, the orphans, and the foreigners who are in the land. Um, and so these are themes that occur over and over and over again. Idolatry and not caring for people in need. I mean, these are the two primary things. And that would make sense. Jesus says the two commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbors yourself. So it makes sense that those are the two things the Bible condemns the most. There are other things the Bible condemns, empty religion, and, and it does condemn uh, a number of sexual sins. Uh, it condemns stealing. And I think if you read the Ten Commandments, you're aware of this. But for the most part, the Bible is not a compendium, a compendium of things that are opposed. Instead, what we find in the Bible is a foundation laid for the way things should be. And deviations from that are sometimes addressed and sometimes not. The Bible does not address every single deviation from what should be the norm. So the question is, what does the Bible lay down as the norm when it comes to family relationships, sexual relationships, gender identity, all of those things? The Bible does not condemn deviations or condemn lots of stuff. Instead, the Bible has a ton to say about male and female, male and female relationships, gender identity, and all those kind of things. I mean, the Bible starts right off the beginning. God made, according to Genesis 1, 26 to 27, male and female. God made two genders, 
and that's it. There are no other gender options. There's no reason for the Bible to spend verse after verse condemning gender identity stuff or any kind of, there's male and female. Anything that deviates from male and female is considered a deviation from God's norm, which makes it sin. So the Bible doesn't need to give the laundry list of sin. So one reason why there's only one verse in the entire Bible that addresses cross-dressing is because there is a male and a female, and there's a male way of dressing and a female way of dressing. And I know that those are different in every culture, but it doesn't matter. In your culture, whatever the male dress is, that's what men wear, and whatever the female dress is, that's what females wear. And men don't pretend to be women, and women don't pretend to be men. Uh, you're a man or you're a woman, and that's it. Matter of fact, there are a number of references in the Old Testament and several in the New Testament to the way men dress and the way women dress. Um, and there is some condemnation there. You're not supposed to be ostentatious and wear stuff, try to make people impressed with you and to show that you're better than someone else type of thing. Um, and so, but the underlying assumption in those discussions, particularly in 1 Corinthians and somewhat in 1 Timothy as well, is that there is female dress and male dress. And that's it. And men don't wear female women's clothing. Like, it just addressed is the norm and so anything that would deviate from that and so the same comes for homosexuality Uh, it's really surprising that the bible addresses it as many times as it does because there's really no need to address homosexuality the bible is very clear god made male and female and he calls them husband and wife right from the beginning as a matter of fact jesus is going to do this exact thing in his ministry and i just selected mark even though this is actually recorded in all the gospels So in Mark chapter 10, uh, Jesus left and went to the region of Judea beyond Jordan. And crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up and in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So Jesus says, look, we could talk about a gazillion different kinds of interpersonal relationships. We could talk about every possible definition of marriage that human beings could come up with. We could discuss five or six dozen different gender options that you can find on Facebook. But Jesus doesn't do all of that. Jesus goes right to the core. This is how it's supposed to be. Male and female, husband and wife. This is the only place where marriage is acceptable between husband and wife, male and female. That's it. So Jesus doesn't spend all this time talking about all the many deviations from that. Jesus says, look, let's get right to the heart of the issue. Here's the way it's supposed to be. And anything that deviates from that is wrong. And so, as Christians, our responsibility is, yes, to say some of these behaviors are wrong. They're not approved by Scripture. But it's more important that we declare, here is God's norm. Here is God's standard. Here is God's expectation. So, yes, homosexuality is wrong. But so is bestiality. So is incest. So is polygamy, which is condemned in Scripture. I know there are people polygamists, and I'm going to do a Theology Thursday on that at some point. That, that, that all of these things are deviations from God's norm. God's norm is male, female. They're married to each other, husband and wife. Anything that deviates from that is wrong. It's sin. So we don't have to come up with a laundry list of everything that's wrong. We need to proclaim very clearly, this is what God did. This was God's intention. This is what God has declared as right. The Bible over and over and over again discusses husbands and wives. The Bible over and over and over again discusses men and women, male and female. No other options are ever given. No other options are really even discussed. This is how it is. This is what's right. And so what do human beings do? We have a tendency, because we're sinful, to want to distort what God has said, to warp what God has said, to defy what God has said. And so we come up with all these ways 
of living in defiance of God. And I believe one of the reasons why our culture celebrates homosexuality the way that it does is because they love to see people defy God. It is a, it is a defiance, we'll do what we want, we'll decide what's right uh, kind of mindset rather than God will decide. But God didn't decide. God declared from the beginning, male, female, the only two genders. Wife is brought to the husband, they get married. That's the only form of marriage that's acceptable. And they are to be married for life and let no man separate them. That's what Jesus says in Matthew, in Mark chapter 10. So living together and all these other things that we come up with, uh, they're not acceptable. They're a deviation. And deviations from God's norm is sin. So I just want to address the issue, but I want to make sure we address it the right way. I think we make a mistake when we come at it by trying to find verses that condemn everything we think ought to be condemned. Instead, let's go right to the heart of the issue. Has God said there's a norm? And God has said there's a norm. Male, female. That's it. They don't try to become the other. There's no blurring. There's no other options. There's nothing in between. It's not about how you feel or how you self-identify. It's nothing like that. You're a male or you're female. That's it. And marriage is, between, be, is to be between a male and a female. And that's it. There is no way, no way to read the Bible any other way. There's no place in the Bible where anything else is considered acceptable. So yeah, we don't have a lot of verses that address this. But we do have a lot of verses that address it. Because all the verses that declare God's norm address it directly and certainly indirectly. So let's rejoice. If you're a male, rejoice that God made you a man. If you're a female, rejoice that God made you a woman. You are made in God's image, whether you're a woman or a man. You're equally made in God's image. But God has declared that you are distinct, and we don't blur those lines. And God has said, man, I set it up this way because it makes marriage so good, because each part, the male and the female, brings something unique and special to the marriage. And together, they become one flesh all done to the glory of God. So celebrate who you are. Celebrate that God has made you who you are and realize the Bible doesn't allow for any other options. So I hope this helps a little bit as we engage our culture and as we engage people in these kind of discussions. And when you do, I do pray that you would do it in a very kind and Christian manner. But stand for the truth, one male, one female. So God bless you and you have a fantastic day.